So how are we doing? Good. Everybody good? Yes. It's a pretty good day, yeah? The index only 102. Cool snap. Buddy. Let's begin with a prayer. You bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we begin our service this evening, we are so grateful that you've blessed our lives up to this point, that we can come together here. We're so thankful for each other. We pray as we enter into this study that we will have a goal and an attitude to learn more about how you have us to live our lives, that we'll take lessons such as from your apostle Paul, and that we'll listen to historically what happened back at that point in history, but most importantly, that we'll make application of our lives as well. Be with those that are less fortunate, and forgive us of our sins, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, and uh, you know, there are so many ways to look at things. Uh, like if somebody says, did you see that? And you might easily say, I sure did. But then when they describe what they saw, you realize you were looking, but you didn't see that. Sometimes there's more than meets the eye. It's the same way that the scriptures is. That when we begin to study, uh, especially the apostolic uh, letters, it is really easy to read the verses and superficially, I like that very <laughs> learn that point. Superficially say, oh yeah, I get that. I studied that. Then you get somebody who's a scholar, not me, somebody like I always uh, list the mic sometimes, and I can tell there's a man that spends a lot of time studying. And uh, he'll just say things, and I'll just think, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever thought of that or heard of that. And I always appreciate that. And you realize there are different levels of understanding. Uh, when I was uh, listening to him talk about the introduction to this epistle, and he talked about uh, Corinth and the size of the city. It's hard to imagine there were cities that large when life was that primitive co compared to us. I don't know what the life expectancy was for people at that day and time. I, I remember hearing, I think one time when during Jesus' life, was it the life expectancy like 40 years or something like that? Brent, is that about right? 30 or 40 years? Imagine that. And yet a city could have hundreds of thousands of people. And, uh, of course, as, as he talked about, he talked about the, uh, the Greek influence. And you look at a map and you see uh, Athens and you see Corinth, and they're not that far apart. And when you go to visit that part of the world today, as some of you have, you're amazed at how that their uh, uh, historical significance has still been brought forward. They've retained so many of the uh, original uh, buildings. Uh, you can go to Athens, and uh, there's the Parthenon. And uh, then you can see the, the theater. And then there's Mars Hill, and it's right in the middle of a city that, other than that, you think you're in Chicago or, or uh, you know, New York or something, and you're just driving along, and there's all these skyscrapers, and you come to an intersection, you look up there, and there's the Acropolis. And it's all still there. And uh, they still quote their uh, famous uh, Greek scholars. And you see their sayings and, uh, all over the town. So you can imagine that if you went back to this first century time, this is when a lot of this was, uh, was happening. It, it appears that the, the major theme of this particular chapter is Paul drawing a contrast between the thinking of God and the thinking of man, between what he had come to teach them and what others had come and were coming to teach them, how that it might seem frivolous, and yet it's 
extremely significant, and how that there would be opposition from people that they respect, and why that opposition was there. And so, if you just glance back just for a moment in the uh, first chapter, which is what we were into last week, but I want you to look at verse 18. He says, the word of the cross is what? What's your version say? Foolishness. foolishness. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How could something be the power of the creator of the universe to one human being and be foolishness to another human being? The message was the same. How they received it was it was totally different. He said in verse 22, the Jews are looking for signs and the Greeks search for wisdom. Well, we just preach Christ crucified, which is to the Jews a stumbling block and the Gentiles foolishness. And then he said in verse 25, and Mike mentioned this last week, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In verse 27, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. Now, I said all that because he's going into the second chapter with that very same type of thought. Remember what I just said. Now, we're, we've gone a week between studying what we studied last week and this week, but this was all happening in this letter. They're just reading it. And the, the one sentence is followed by another, followed by another, and they're all connected. So he says in the first verse, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Okay, so you see that as he said previously, we're just preaching Christ crucified, and some people just think, well, that's so foolish. So there was a person that you knew, and he was crucified. A lot of people were crucified. And what you're trying to say about him, you know, just doesn't make any sense at all. And if there is such a thing as a God, Surely he wouldn't have chosen that route. The Jews are saying, we're still looking for the Messiah because we know when he comes, it's going to change the world militarily because he's going to have a kingdom and that kingdom's going to rule and it'll never, ever be abolished because that's what the prophets, we study those prophets every day. That's what they said, so we're waiting on that. And both of them missed the most significant historical moment in the history of the world. Only difference was the Greeks weren't looking for it. The Jews had spent generations looking for it and praying for it. And it came and went and they were the reason he was killed. And the ones that killed him thought they had stopped this mad man from his false teaching when what they did was fulfill the prophecy. They did exactly what Isaiah said was going to happen. And they still didn't get it. Now they're still chasing Paul around because he's preaching this nonsense. Isn't it fascinating? You know, I, uh, I told my kids growing up to turn the TV off, the greatest entertainment is just sitting in the car at a Walmart parking lot. Right? <laughs> just watching people come and go and the crazy things that, that happen. And uh, just watching human nature because we are all individually <coughs> pretty pretty weak, pretty few. Uh, it's not within man to direct his own steps. There's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, and yet most people, you couldn't tell them what to do if they tried. They already know. And they're going the wrong way. So Paul is saying to these people, remember who he's talking to. He's 
not talking to the general public. This is a letter going to the people that have obeyed the gospel. Well, they got problems because when Paul left them, he left them in a wicked city, and he left them going to and fro every day with all the people that still had their family, they still had their neighbors. They didn't have cable TV, but there was all kinds of entertainment, not the least of which were these speakers that Paul was trying to say he was not. Now, if you study Greek history, you'll realize they went through that period of time, centuries before that, where they had the Aristotles and the Plato's and, and the Sosthenes and, and uh, Pliny the Elder, I'm thinking of all the ones, and, uh, and, and uh, that was the age of Greek wisdom. Well, those people all died, and there were not immediate successors. So they were still quoting these people. Well, they're still quoting them today. Okay. But then another group of people came along, and this group of people went around wanting to look just as important and being very eloquent, very good at speaking. And they would draw crowds. And they would go on and on and on, talking about life and talking about uh, uh, wisdom, when in reality, they were mere shells of what these other people were, if you even put those people at a, at a level of uh, intelligence. So I did a little studying on this, and, uh, and I... I studied about these guys, and uh, there's been a bunch of people writing about them, and I, <coughs> where is it, they said, these people were very gifted communicators. Their voices and their demeanor were very attractive. They had what some people today call the gift of gab, and they were so good they performed professionally. They were not really philosophers, yet people wanted to be philosophized too. And since they looked the part, they would listen to them. But they were really traveling exhibitionists who went from city to city to entertain the people with their rhetorical skills. And their appearance was very important. Most of them were very athletic, and a second century historian said they look like gorgeous peacocks. Picture this. They appeared in elaborate dress with their hair all fixed up. They wore expensive jewelry. They had a sing-song voice with charming pronunciations and a rhythm to their speech. They had expressive glances and theatrical gestures, stopping their feet and falling to their knees, then pausing for the applause and shouts of approval. They would begin their talks with an introductory speech that would say flattering words about the city and the people, make generous gifts to the city from the money they had got from the previous city. They would speak on a wide range of topics and never give the crowd a chance to ask any questions. Sounds like a politician. Can you picture, though, what I'm trying to tell you is this is why Paul spends so much time in this particular chapter talking about what he's not. Because here's a guy coming into town, and he's a speaker, and this was in Acts the 18th and the 19th chapter. Now he's writing them letters. And meanwhile, these guys are traveling in and out of the city of Corinth, and they're making their talks, and they're talking about life and the future and how you should spend your money and spend your time and what you should be doing. And uh, Paul is drawing a distinction. I came to you, brethren, not with superiority of speech or of wisdom, but proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, there are people that I've read, and I respect their writings, who think that 
what he's doing here is drawing a distinction between what happened at Athens and, and, and uh, what he wants to do with these folks. So you remember when Paul was in Athens and, uh, and he got up and he made the talk and uh, he made particular <coughs> reference to how they were worshiping everything. They had a God for everything, right? And then he said, you have so many of these and you even have one addressed to the what? <laughs> the unknown God. And he said, this is the one I want to preach to you about. And he matched them rhetorically, style with style. Well, what happened? Well, it didn't turn out so well. And there are some commentators that are saying that he's looking at Corinth and he's going to use a different tactic. That he's not going to try to raise himself up to be some uh, rhetorical uh, expert uh, are not going to be someone to compete with these people that they're listening to. He basically is going to just simplify it down and say, I didn't come and do my homework on you and your cultures and your people and all of these different things. I just came to teach you the will of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, you think he's referring back to when he visited with them personally? That's what it sounds like, right? What do you think he meant there? I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. What was he afraid of? Or was he afraid of when he was in Corinth? Anybody? I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. He knew persecution was coming. And the persecution was with Paul everywhere he went. So he didn't have somewhat fear about that. Turn, I agree. Turn it, turn to Acts the 18th chapter. I didn't write this verse down, but it's in there. Yeah. Look at verse 9. This is when Paul was at Corinth. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And the next verse says he stayed there 18 months. Now this is the Lord talking to Paul in a vision. This is an inspired moment. And, and my version says, New American Standard Version, do not be afraid any longer, which would mean what? He's been afraid. He's been afraid. <laughs> Paul was a person. And I don't know at this point how many times he had been stoned, beaten, <clears throat> threatened. Uh, ostracized, all of these things were terrible things that happened to him. He's just a person. He's in a town with several hundred thousand people. I'd be looking over my shoulder, wouldn't you? Can you imagine how it felt to him when he had a vision and the Lord said, you're okay. Let me just tell you, there's nobody going to touch you in the army. i got a lot of people here. Now, that, doesn't that remind you a little bit of who was it in the Old Testament that thought he was the only one left? Elijah. And uh, he just sat down and died, didn't he? And that was right after he'd done that miraculous thing at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And what did God tell him? Yes, he does. And what else did he say? He, he mentioned thousands of people he had that had never bowed their knee to Baal. Now, wouldn't it have been something to have lived in that time when God would speak directly to you? Imagine that, Todd. God speaking directly to you and saying, Todd, it's okay. Get up and go to work tomorrow. Everything's going to be fine. Well, you'd have a whole different attitude driving to work, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, guess what? That's what he's doing. That's what the scriptures are doing through the Holy Spirit. They're speaking to us tonight, telling us everything's going to be okay. There's not any person that can touch your soul unless you allow it. And Jesus said in Matthew, don't be afraid of the people 
that can hurt your body. The body's like clothes. Beware of who can get to your soul. So Paul is saying, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching was not, here we go again, in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Your thoughts on what he means by that? We're looking at verses 4 and 5. Pardon? He took himself out of it. He was He was he wanted God to have the glory. He wanted the people to see God to be, but not seeing him personally. Okay. So it wasn't going to be in his manner of speaking. But what did he mean by the demonstration of the spirit and of power? He's talking about spiritual gifts and the actual power of God and, and demonstrations of power versus words. Did Paul do miracles in Corinth? I don't remember a particular instance where it says here was a blind man and he could see. But what was the purpose of the spiritual gifts that they had? It was to establish their authenticity that they could do what people could not do, which was the gift that God gave them through the Holy Spirit. So the reference to me in 2 Corinthians, he makes some comment about spiritual gifts because they were having some issues with that. To me, I believe that's what he means, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, it may not have been written in the verses, but it could very likely be that the people reading this are saying, remember when he did that? No normal man could have done that. Because how did God feel that the apostles could even warrant a group of people who would follow them under threat of death it's not any different than when Moses didn't want to go to Egypt. He was scared. Remember? And uh, God said, go ahead and go. And he said, well, I'm not a good speaker. All right, I'll take Aaron. I bet Aaron was not happy. Right? Aaron probably didn't want to go either. But what did God give them when they went to fear, fear before favor? What did he give them? Then? He gave them powers, didn't he? Remember what he could do? He could throw his rod down and what happened? It became a snake. And he could pick the snake up and it became a rod. Remember that? Now why in the world would God do that? Because it was a gift that the Almighty God could give the people that were his messengers to say, this is not just somebody dropping by. They are representing me. Paul was representing Jesus. Verse 6. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. So we're speaking wisdom among those who are mature. Now, the King James Version you know, typically uses a different word than mature. Remember how one word it would always used? Perfect. Perfect. And to us, perfection means something that is unattainable. But to the uh, old English language, they took, the, they took the original Greek word and made perfect mean grown up, mature. Okay. So if you look at verse 6, He's basically saying, those that are mature would be mature in what way? Yes, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Mature how? In age? Spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. All right. What's the wisdom? If you're spiritually mature, he's writing a letter to the Christians in Corinth. He's talking to the ones who have taken what he left them with and have gone to another level of thinking with this. Now there were people that took this 
letter and read it and went, well, how nice. I'm glad he's doing well. Looked at it like a postcard. I bet there were other people that read it and read it and read it and studied it and read it and then got together with other people and said, what do you think this means and that means? And they probably cried together. And, can you imagine? And they took it to yet another level. And he said, those are the people that we can then, who was it that said, when for the time you ought to be able to eat meat? You have need that someone teach you again? Yeah. Remember the inspired writer said that, you know, a, a, a baby starts with milk, but then it matures to where it can eat meat. And that was the application to that. And look what he says in verse 6. This wisdom, however, is not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. Now, again, if you have a different version, it may say princes of the world. Anybody got a version that says that? Princes of the world. And, uh, but who do you think he's talking about here? Yeah, or, or anybody in power. Anybody in power. And what does he say is happening to those people? They're passing away. That's what happens to people, isn't it? The very people that you are so frustrated with right now in the world today will be gone in a few years. Because people pass away. And guess what? So will we. But we speak God's wisdom, verse 7, in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Ah, people love this passage. For generations of time, people who have wanted the attention have tried to convince other people that they've got the inside track information line. Because they're so much smarter or so much more educated, or God has spoken to them. And since this whole thing's a mystery, you need to come to me and I'll tell you what it is. You know that's still going on, isn't it? Still going on. Well, Michael, I know you come from a history of Catholicism, and and I listen to the headlines from time to time, and I think that. That, that whole thing has changed so much since you were a kid, hasn't it? It seems that the person who's at the top right now is subject to criticism. And I think years ago when I was a kid growing up, I don't think anybody ever questioned me. Because to the, to the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope was who? God on earth. I think I'm saying that right. And whatever he said uh, was the was the was the truth. Look what Paul was saying here. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom that God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. If they'd understood it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Well, I guess not. Now, why didn't they understand it? Because it was a mystery. Why was it a mystery? Why did God present his plan as a mystery? That's from the Greek word. It sounds like mystery, but stereo. It actually means mystery. So if you're watching a movie that's a mystery, typically what does that mean? You don't know who did it till the end, right? And they keep you in suspense. You're going, it's her, it's him, it's them, it's nobody, it's everybody. At the end, maybe there's a big surprise if it's a really good movie. Is that the way it is? Why would God present his plan to be a mystery to everybody? Ah, it wasn't a mystery to everybody. 3,000 people obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And the Jewish leaders went around trying to kill them. Why was it a mystery to them? Go back to verse 25 of the first chapter. Go back even before that. The word of the cross is foolishness of those who are perishing. Verse 18. For the Jews seek for signs and the Greeks seek for wisdom. 
We're preaching Christ crucified to the Jews. That's a stumbling block. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man. The weakness of God is stronger than man. See, all these verses tie together. What he's saying is the wisdom that we teach is a mystery to those who will not listen and make the application. Don't, how did the Jews of the synagogue read Isaiah 53 after Jesus had been crucified? Can't you think of one of them that would have said, wait a minute here. Born in poverty, born in a manger, led like a sheep to the slaughter, yet he opened his mouth. mouth. How could they not see that? These were the smartest people in their nation because they didn't want to. Close my eyes. They didn't want it. It's the same today. Nothing has changed, and we can include ourselves in that when it comes to change. And Jesus, I mean, Paul is saying here in an inspired way that if these people had understood it, they never would have crucified the Lord. And then in verse 9, by the way, before we do that, somebody turn to 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. I've written that down and got to place it on the top. 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Whoever, whoever gets it first. Of which salvation the prophets had inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied the grace that should come unto you, searching for what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was within and did signify, when it testified before him the suffering for Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister things, which are now recorded unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Isn't that interesting? The prophets who were prophesied what was going to happen didn't understand what they were talking about. They were trying to figure it out. It wasn't like God said, I'm going to give you a little tip, this is going to happen in a thousand years. And so I'm going to, No. He told them what to say, and they prophesied what they said, and the Holy Spirit gave them that information. And why was it there? It was there so that seamlessly from creation and from the fall of man and the first sin and the, the, the uh, separation from God, and you're out of the Garden of Eden, and sin separates uh, uh, man and God, Isaiah 59. So that we today... And those at that time could look at the Old Testament scriptures, and we can now look at the completed gospel. We don't need someone to heal the sick to know it's perfectly all together, historically and accurately done and historically foretold. And people couldn't see it then, and they can't see it now. Verse 9, just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. If you're trying to find that particular passage, you won't find it. It's a, it's a combination of Isaiah 64.4 and Isaiah 65.17 is about the closest that uh, people can find because there is not a particular verse if that is word from word from. But the point is there. God has prepared for those who love him a wonderful, wonderful life eternal. But man can't understand it by himself. Verse 10. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now that Spirit would be who? The Holy Spirit. And it would do us all a lot of good to study more about the Holy Spirit. Because we, we, got, we got God the Father. We got that one down. He created the world. Well, no, they were all there. Let us. Who would the ask be? God the Father? God the Son? God the Holy Spirit? We get all mixed up in the denominational world of Calvinism and, and uh, on and on we go. The Holy Spirit is some mysterious character and he's alive and well today and that's why people 
get up to speak times and all these sort of things. It's really not complex. There was a design for God the Father, or a design for God the Son, and a design for God the Holy Spirit. And if we look at the attributes of the Holy Spirit, then we understand that one of the attributes is the Holy Spirit was the revealer of God's will. It was the Holy Spirit that fell on the apostles and they spoke in tongues. It was the Holy Spirit that gave them the opportunity to do these miraculous things. It was the Holy Spirit that guided them inspirationally into what to say. Even the prophets, when they didn't understand it, the will of God had to be revealed to the creation of God, humanity. And it was the Holy Spirit that did that. And it says, He, the Holy Spirit, searches all things, even the depths of God. Nobody knows God like the Holy Spirit knows God, is what he's saying. There's nothing about God the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Because he is God. Who is God? The Holy Spirit. No, God is God. Well, God is God. God the Father. But there's also God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and it's hard to wrap your arms around that, isn't it? But it shouldn't be that complicated. Paul is trying to say no one knows in verse 11 the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man who is in him. I can look at Jeff and say, I know exactly what you're thinking. I know you've had people say that. Yeah, I know Christine says that. Carla says that. <laughs> Carla's right most of the time. <laughs> but you really don't know for sure, do you? Do you, Andy? You don't know what I'm thinking. You can think you know what I'm thinking. But who knows the spirit of a man except the man in whom it is his spirit. Ah, but God knows all. Which God? All of them. And the Holy Spirit knows everything about God. So whatever he says goes. Isn't this wonderful to read this and study this? I know that you don't know, verse 11, the thoughts of a man. Only he knows. Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Look what he's saying. Paul is, is saying, I've come to you, and I've taught you the gospel, and you obeyed it, We've established a church, and now you've got all kinds of problems. And I'm writing this letter to you saying, no, you can't do that. No, you can't think like that. No, you can't treat people like that. No, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And chapter after chapter after chapter, he's continually saying, but his major point is, I'm just not one of those speakers coming through town. Remember the things I did when I was there? And I'm trying to explain it to you. I am nothing except the Spirit of God is revealing to me what God wants me to do. And I prove to you by my life and by what I've shown you I can do that I'm being led by God. We have received not the worldly spirit, but the godly spirit. So now we can know the things God has freely given us. How do you feel when you're studying the Bible? How do you feel when you're in a Bible class tonight? Does it make the hair on the back of your neck stand up to realize God is speaking to you and me right now? In verse 13. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now look at that phrase, spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. I'm going, what does that mean? So I'll ask you, what do you think that means? Combining those two things together. The word spoken or God's words. What's the difference between the spiritual thoughts and the spiritual words. Spiritual words are putting into communication form what God's thoughts are, right? I agree. I think that's what he's saying. I mean, 
let's face it, folks, God created the world. Do we need to go to the solar system and all the things I've heard the lessons here to, to prove there's a God in heaven? Even in the most primitive societies, they're trying to worship something. They know there's something bigger than that. We got the knowledge of knowing who it is. Don't you think if he created us, there was a reason for it? We're not here by accident. We all know this. But to them, to people in Corinth, they would go to these synagogues and just go through indescribable sins and think they were worshiping? Don't you think that the inner nature of these people would sometimes say, this can't be right. This can't be right. This is hurting people. I'm worshiping by hurting people? It can't be right. Verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things that are of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness, man, he can't understand them. Because they're spiritually appraised. Now that should tell you who he's considering the natural man is. It would be who? Those are that's exactly that's exactly what he's saying. He's talking about the people who refuse the revealing of God's word. They're not into the revelation of that. So they're still operating at the human nature, which is barely above an animal, right? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? When we die, we're dead. It's all over. The human nature by himself without God's intervention is pretty primitive and helpless, helpless, helpless. So he can't accept these things from the Spirit of God. What things? The things Paul was preaching to him. Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was deity. He came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He, he, he lived 33 years. He was killed on a cross. And, and, and the people he came to save were the ones that killed him. And here it says a thousand years ago where it was all going to happen. It's all right here. And they're going, I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. You took us back to Acts chapter 18 while ago. Uh, he'd been trying to convince the Jews that, and, and, the, and the Greeks too, but, that Jesus was the Christ to the point that they, uh, they blasphemed and right. he got to the point where he said, your blood be upon your own head. I, I want to turn to the Gentiles. I turn to the Gentiles. That's, I had that verse down. I didn't, I didn't say it, but I thank you for that. That is so true. Last two verses. But to he who is spiritual, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, King James says judges, yet he himself is appraised or judged by no one. Now how can a Christian judge? Because they understand God's word. Because they're not doing the judging, they're simply pointing out the scripture. If you see somebody living in error, you're not going to tell them and say, well, here's what I think. You're going to open up the Bible and show what the Bible has to say about that. You've been given that opportunity to do so. So I know people say, judge not that you be not judged. I understand that. But it doesn't say don't condemn sin and don't condemn people who are sitting. Jesus did it. He called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said they were like whited tombs. What do you think he was doing? Was he judging them? Well, what do you think Paul was doing in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, when he says, you've taken your father's wife? You know? So he said that the, the spiritual person can appraise all things, but he can't be appraised by any man. Men down here, the natural man, they had not got a clue. So they can criticize them, they can say all these sort of things. It means nothing. Finally, for he who has known the mind of the Lord, for who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him. We have the mind of Christ. What a great way to end that chapter. We'll do chapter 3 next week.
Presentation Psalm will be 274. If you want to follow along with the book. Before we get started, I offer an invitation. I pray for a good class out here this evening. Done a good job. Thank you to all the men that have stepped up and, and filled in for Mike in his absence. Pray that you all will remember those that are filling in on Sunday. Keep them in your prayers as well. But the work will continue on without, without Mike here. If you want to follow along with me, the invitation is nice. It's going to come from 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, 1 through 13. <coughs> and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had not, save one little youth man, which he had brought, which he had bought and nursed up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's land and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, lost my place there. And he said to Nathan, and the Lord, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I have gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of his son. For thou didst in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt, thou shalt not die. Now, as many of us know, the story of David, 1 Samuel 13, 14, and Acts 13, 22, David is mentioned as a man after God's own heart. But here in this section of scriptures, we have God, through Nathan, exposing his sin or sins. David had once saw that Bathsheba bathing and lusted after her and had her brought to him and laid him and she became pregnant. He committed adultery. Then David knew his sin was going to be found out because Uriah was nowhere around. He was with the army. So he knew that people would know that the, the child would not be Uriah's. So he had Uriah brought back home. 
And he tried his best to get him to go home to his wife to lay with her. So that he and everyone else would think that was his child. But it didn't work. David tried to cover his sin. So since it didn't work, I want you to turn with me to Jeremiah 17 real fast. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately weak who can know it. If we give our heart over to sin, our heart can lead us into more sin. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is wicked. We give our heart over to wickedness, wickedness will pursue. And it did for David. David tried to cover his sin, but he couldn't. So ultimately, he had to ride and kill in battle. So he committed murder. In the scriptures we read in 2 Samuel 12, in verse 9, God points out to David, that he has despised his commandment. And he has done evil in his sight. Because that's exactly what sin is in the eyes of God. Is it's evil. God's, God does not like sin. He does not accept sin. Therefore, it's evil. Verse 12. He tells David that he done it secretly. But if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of, whom, of him whom we have to do. So David thought he done his sin secretly. God, as God pointed out. But nothing is in secret to God. God knows all. God sees all. But often we, we look at these sins that David committed. And we think about the scripture that says he's a man after God's own heart. In verse 13 we find out why God is earth. David is a man after God's own heart. If you read through Psalm 32, God expresses the sins that he was dealing with. He expresses how heavily they were during these months that God left them with those sins. He said that the, the hand of the Lord was heavy upon him. But in Psalm 32, just as in verse 13 of 2 Samuel 12, David confesses his sin. He didn't get mad at Nathan when Nathan brought his sin before him because he was a man after God's own heart. He'd been hurt. His heart has been, had been hurting for months. And when Nathan came to him, he confessed. I came across a story yesterday. In closing, I'm going to read this story. I think it fits in very well with this, with this lesson. <clears throat> A little boy visiting his grandparents was given his first slingshot. He had, he had great fun playing with it in the woods. He would take aim and let the stone fly, but he never hit a thing. Then on his way home for lunch, he cut through the backyard and he saw grandmother's pet duck. He took aim and let the stone fly. It went straight to the mark and to his horror, the duck fell dead. The boy panicked. In desperation, he took the dead duck and he hid it in the woodpile. 
Then he saw his sister Sally standing by the corner of the house. She had seen the whole thing. They went into lunch. Sally said nothing. After lunch, grandmother said, okay, Sally, let's clear the table and wash the dishes. Sally said, oh, grandmother, Johnny said he wanted to help you in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? And she whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later in the day, grandfather called the children to go fishing. Grandmother said, I'm sorry, but Sally can't go. She has to stay here and help me clean the house and get supper. Sally smiled and said, that's all been taken care of. Johnny said he wanted to help today, didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered, remember the duck. This went on for several days. Johnny did all the chores, his and those assigned to Sally. Finally, he couldn't stand it any longer. So he went to his grandmother and confessed all. She took him in, in her arms and said, I know, Johnny. I was standing at the kitchen window and I saw the whole thing. And because I love you, I forgave you. And knowing that I love you, I would always forgive you. I wondered just how long you would let Sally make a slave. See, that's exactly what happened to David. Committed a sin with Bathsheba. And instead of owning the sin and confessing it and getting out of it, he became a slave. Just as it did the boy in the story. God loves us. And just like the grandmother said she looked out, was looking out the window and saw it all. God's window covers the whole world. And he sees it all. All he wants is us to repent. He wants us to confess. He wants us to get rid of that sin. And bring it to him. So if there's anyone here tonight that needs to be restored to the Lord or needs to become a Christian for the first time, you have that opportunity. God's standing in the window. He's looking down on you and me. And all he wants is us to repent and wants us to live faithful lives and service to him. If there's anything we can do for you, please come forward as we say this. <coughs>
few announcements before we dismiss the prayer. Our closing song, which will be number 224, and our closing prayer with my brother Ken Johnson. I will invite everyone on our next service time, Sunday morning at 9, for Bible class and for worship. And again, uh, Sunday evening at 5. I welcome those that may be visiting here. I don't see anyone, but or online. We certainly welcome you here. I want to thank Ray and Todd for a good job tonight filling in. And for Ray filling in for Mike and Todd did a nice job on the invitation. Let's remember our sick. The only new one I have here was JC asked me to announce that her and Bentley's great grandmother and Stephanie's grandmother, Edna Crother, uh, Crother uh, fell and broke four ribs. And she's 98 years old. So let's pray that she recovers and check on uh, check on her. So uh, so this can be remembered, Sister Shirley Berry, who wasn't feeling well on Sunday, let's check on her and the rest that are in the bulletin as well. And uh, that's all the announcements I have, so if we'll be standing, we'll have our closing song and then our closing prayer. There's a rainbow in the cloud. We'll sing all three verses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I go.
guide us and protect us and bring us back again at the next appointed time. Forgive us of our sins as we meet the conditions for that forgiveness. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.